So we're going to look at uh, we're going to look at Luther and uh, the claim of the uh, reformers that Scripture interprets itself. Um, and I've, I'm taking it from Gerald Brun's uh, compendium of various uh, essays on historical. So it's called Hermeneutics, Ancient and Modern. And uh, this is a topic that became of great interest to me when I became a Christian uh, and studied the Romantic period as well. Um, because in the Romantic period, a very different hermeneutic, hermeneutics arises, uh, that of Friedrich Schleiermacher, which is often called the general hermeneutics, um, sometimes liberal hermeneutics, but he's, he's considered the father of uh, modern hermeneutic, hermeneutics at any rate. And, and we're going to come to him in a, f in a few classes. But in uh, Schleiermacher's understanding, all texts have the same methodology um, and are to be treated essentially the same. You don't, you don't make a distinction between scripture or a sacred text and uh, vernacular text or secular text. You don't make any distinction whatsoever in, in how you read them. Uh, and that is how the academy reads texts, including scripture now, uh, and including in the biblical studies departments. Um, they adopt the methodology of the 18th century, the historical critical method, and then apply the general hermeneutics and treat it just like any other text, which is problematic if you think that its claim for itself is that it is uh, God-breathed. So it's a, it's a text that's been delivered God, by God and therefore will need to be, at least let's say for the sake of argument, we need to consider that there might be something different about this text than the other text, the authorship alone. And then you get into the complexities of the fact that it was clearly written by, by human authors as well. So the Pentateuch is written by Moses, recounting events, however, that preceded his life, like the creation of everything. So it's not, it's not a first, I mean, what, I don't even know what the narrative perspective would be there. It's clearly not he was present. Uh, it's, it's received by him and passed on. Um, and so that alone makes it an unusual text. Uh, later texts will not suffer the same challenges that the Pentateuch will, but the Pentateuch is basically the foundation of the later uh, books in Scripture. So that alone will make the Bible a unique text. Um, but then how to read Scripture properly is, is the issue. And we're going to look at how Luther responds to the challenges of the medieval period and in particular, the claim in, in which really starts the Reformation that the church is uh, claiming doctrines that scripture does not even mention, like the doctrine of purgatory and indulgences and so forth. And, um, and then the, the issue or the problem arises over, of who is authoritative in interpreting the scriptures then. There then becomes a, a matter of authority. And Luther's claim will be that uh, God remains authoritative over his own word. And we are under the authority of scripture. It possesses its own inherent authority by virtue of the fact that it's uh, a text that comes from God. And it's never the case that we are um, to stand above the scriptures in determining its meaning. It conveys its own meaning to us because the Holy Spirit works alongside the creator in bringing the meaning of the text to the reader. That will be Luther's claim because of the unique features of Holy Writ. He's not going to claim that for Homer or any other author, but he will for this particular one. It's an, a pneumatic text. 
pneuma, the Greek word for spiritual. It's a spiritual text. And so this moves the discussion in, in literary theory a, a bit away from the ancient, what we've seen thus far in, in uh, Horace's Ars Poetica or Sidney's Apology for Poesy, in which they don't, re they don't really engage with this, the, the challenges of scripture uh, as a text, the uniqueness of scripture. They, the, obviously the uniqueness of Christ is a topic in uh, contemporary apologetics. You know, why is Jesus different than the other uh, so-called gods? Uh, what is it that makes him unique? But we're going to extend that then even to scripture being a, a unique sort of text because of its divine origin and authorship and the authority over it. And that will become one of the issues I'm going to talk to in, in, in a minute. But largely it is because it, and I think it's already hinted at in the uh, work that we looked at previously as well by Augustine, when he speaks about scripture, um, the purpose of scripture being a loving purpose to convey us uh, to God who is loving and human life being like a journey and, in, and there's a sort of ordo amoris. And God himself who is love is not, a, uh, is not visible. And heaven is not yet visible. There will be one day in the new heaven and the new earth, there will, it will be a matter of not just faith, but sight. There will no be, be no more, we'll see God face to face. And so the, uh, the challenge in this world of the Ordo Amoris and the, the higher levels of the Ordo Amoris being as yet unseen will no longer be a problem, but for now it is a problem. And the, and the spiritual nature of the scriptures are a reflection of the Ordo Amoris as well. So Augustine's already, I think, um, paving the ground for the challenge that Luther is going to raise about the native authority of scripture and its difference from other texts. That doesn't mean that it's totally indifferent to the usual ways of, other, of looking at other texts, and we talk about in the Bible, uh, that in the Bible as literature. It, it has certain genres we can recognize as it uses figures of speech. It, 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 it does um, speak of this particular world as well. It's not just a sacred text, it's also a, a text that takes seriously human history. So the world of time and space is acknowledged in scripture. So it's not just a spiritual text, it, it, it has a sort of a bivalent character. And it, so there's significant complexity here on this topic. And I, I am going to come to Luther, but I wanted to talk first of all just about how scripture is uh, read even before Luther. Uh, so the topic of exegesis and, and typology. Uh, because this word hermeneutics that I said Bruns uses is not a word that is used uh, historically in the church. It's, an, it's a new term that arises in the 18th century. And um, as somebody who is interested in the history of ideas, I find, I, I try and pay attention or my ears perk up when I see a new word come or a new concept or a new discipline emerge. And my question is always, why was it not called this before, or why are they naming something new here? Like psychology, or sociology, or anthropology, these disciplines are, are new disciplines. That doesn't mean what the, the subject matter within them was never discussed before, but they weren't named as such. And the novelty just, the fact that somebody decides to name a discipline something that has not previously been named suggests that they think there's something unique about the new discipline. Otherwise, they would just speak of it as what it was called before. And it, what it was called before is simply interpretatio, interpretation. That's what hermeneutics is. But there is a difference between the two. And hermeneutics is, is often connected with Schleiermacher's project. So when Bruns calls it hermeneutics ancient and modern, 
it's a bit anachronistic actually because hermeneutics properly speaking doesn't isn't referred to until modern hermeneutics and ancient hermeneutics is interpretatio and it's not quite the same thing so hermeneutics is a word that is connected with Hermes the who's the divine messenger one of the gods that speaks on behalf of Zeus delivers messages to man whereas the interpretation of the Bible um, is largely related to the challenge that uh, Christians have in interpreting the Old Testament. How, as those who live on the other side of the New Testament, um, do we read the Old Testament? And it's, it's to some degree the challenge that the New Testament writers pose to themselves. What's the relation between the two Testaments? And uh, Paul is in particularly uh, particular in interested in this, and he tends to see the Old Testament as a series of, of promises that are fulfilled in Christ. And, um, and all sorts of events, that they can be prefiguring. Or, uh, so, so he presents the Old Testament, um, which does give us Jewish his history and Jewish law, um, he presents it nonetheless as a Christian book. And, and so in the New Testament, they actually, when they refer to the scriptures, they're referring to the Old Testament because the New Testament has not even yet been written. So when they say in accordance with the scriptures, so when Jesus rebuked those on the Emmaus Road, he says that they are foolish because they did not believe all that was written. And yet all that has happened has happened in accordance with the scriptures, it says in Luke, Luke 26, I think. And in accordance with the scriptures, he means the Old Testament scriptures. He's not talking about what he said to the disciples when he said, I'll be raised in three days. He's talking about with the scriptures, what is written, because Jesus hasn't written anything. Jesus doesn't write a book. He's referring to what the Old Testament said about the coming of the Messiah, which, of which he is, that's him. So how then do you read the Old Testament? Well, the, the right reading of the Old Testament is to see its fulfillment in the coming of the Messiah. And yet that is not the way in which we would normally read the Old Testament. It's reading it through the, from the vantage point of, the, of, of Jesus and the apostles' authorization of a way of reading the, old, uh, reading the Old Testament. So it's already bringing in the issue of interpretation, is what I'm saying here. The Old Testament is actually a Christian book. Uh, Paul talks about this several times in his epistles, uh, first and second Corinthians probably being most prominent. Uh, but because of the gospel, the word of God is no longer veiled as it was to the Hebrews. It says this in Hebrews. It's no longer veiled as it was uh, to Moses when the tables of the law were given to the Israelites, but rather we see it un with unveiled faces. Remember Moses' face was, was glowing because of the, his experience in, in, in seeing God. And he didn't even see God. He was put in a rock, remember. He just saw the train of his robe. But he comes down from the mountain, his face is shining, but we see it directly. So that, that sense of how do the Old Testament scriptures speak about the gospel, well, they speak about it in a veiled sense. But now it's been unveiled. And, and Judaism is thus a necessary um, sketch, outline, structure, signpost of what it's pointing to, and what it's pointing to is Christ and what he teaches. Jesus says, I did not come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill the law. So it's not that everything that came before is redundant, it's that it was necessary in order for you to see clearly what I'm now revealing to you clear, uh, clearly. Clearly. 
And uh, in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, uh, Paul says that even unto this day when Moses read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. So when, when Jesus is embraced as the Messiah, is understood to be the Messiah, is accepted by faith as the Messiah, then the veil has been removed at that point. But it's still there in the Old Testament text. You can actually read and uh, references to Christ, but they're veiled references. And how do we uh, describe those terms? Well, Christian authors often use the word typology. And let me talk a little bit about this. And this is the dominant way in which scripture is read in, in the Reformation period. But typology. Uh, this is a practice that um, of, of reading the Old Testament. Of, there's a type and there's an anti-type. So the Old Testament will be the type then, and the anti-type is the new, the promise and the fulfillment. So if you're going, what this means is if you're going to read the New Testament, you actually have to have already read the, the Old Testament to get the full sense of it which is, makes uh, contemporary evangelical practices of only reading the New Testament and preaching on it odd and unhelpful in many ways. Because there's, a, there's, a, there's something there before that which helps clarify what is clearly stated there. So Jesus is the Christ. Well, it doesn't say that in the Old Testament. So this is the clear statement. Yes, but what are, what are the implications of the Christ. What does the Christ actually mean? And then you can look at J the person and work of Jesus Christ. He's, he's the son of David. He's, the, he's therefore the Messiah. He's, um, he's the second Adam. He is the temple in which we are as living stones built into that temple. There is all sorts of references to Old Testaments in the person and work of Jesus Christ, which requires Old Testament knowledge. And without it, it really is, it's a f funny title. Uh, so the word that Christian authors um, will use is often typology. Uh, the Latin word for it, so this is from the Greek word uh, tupos, But in Latin, you will know it as figura, figure, figurative speech. Now, what's funny is that in evangelical discourse, there's a tendency to insist that this is the literal meaning of the text, whereas figurative meanings are, are departures from the literal meaning. But right? So figured, a figurative meaning is an embellishment or a, an extended meaning, like a metaphor. Um, but, but that's not the case here. The, the figura or the t typological reading is just reading the Old Testament or the New Testament in the light of the Old. That is a figurative reading. It's already a figurative reading. It just ha happens also to be the literal re re reading. That is the way you read it literally as you read it figuratively. And you need to acknowledge that because you can't just read it on its own without the Old Testament. Otherwise, you lapse into various heresies like that of the Marcionites. And you misread what the New Testament itself says about the relation of uh, the law to what uh, the Jesus and the apostles say. So the Latin word for this is, and it's an equivalent word for, for type, is figura. And in English, there are all sorts of synonyms for this, and I'll just, I'll just list a few of them um, that you will read in the texts of the Reformation. So 16th, 17th century, so uh, the, great, the golden age of English letters, really. You'll hear uh, type and figure, yes, but you'll also read sign. Think of Augustine's signa. Uh, 
a race and a signa. The signa points to the thing. Well, what's the thing? The thing in this case is God, the ultimate race, the ultimate matter uh, that the scriptures point to is God himself. And we're on a journey towards God. And we come to that through the Ordo Amoris because he is love. So the type, figure, sign, example sometimes. Uh, shadow, foreshadow, adumbration, similitude, all of these are words for similar sorts of things. There are some nuances of difference between them. But you'll find all of these words in English. And, and when you come to, like, say, shadow and foreshadow, you tend to, and this is a problem for English readers because of the influence of Plato, we tend to read it in Platonic terms as a... Um, A pale and insignificant. So in, in Hebrews, it talks about shadows. Um, and you could read that platonically, like the allegory of the cave, which we've looked at as well. And the shadows that are at a remove from reality then, and that, so they're in a sense uh, opposed to it, or they're less true. But that's not how shadow is meant in, uh, in scriptural terms. Shadow is used in the sense of promise and fulfillment, type and anti-type. So here's the sketch, and now it's in technicolor. But the sketch is not inaccurate in any way. Um, type and anti-type are connected temporally. They have a relationship in time. When the antitype comes, it is the full and final interpretation of the type. So you can't add to it. It's, it's what, what is latent or hidden in the type, or is a shadow, in the antitype, it is completely fulfilled. So there's no, nece there's no uh, room for brilliant, innovative readings of what scripture means because it's already been fulfilled clearly and you can't add to it. Uh, which ha tends to be the case in, in Christian circles. It, uh, people are, are often uh, deceived because they understand when scripture is being denied that what's being cl clearly stated in scripture, they say, so when Jesus is risen from the dead, they just say, well, he, he, uh, that didn't happen. It's obvious then a contradiction. Scripture speaks of his resurrection from the dead. He presents himself bodily. The modern critical tradition will say, that's impossible, so that didn't happen. That's saying, that's a negation of that, so that's clearly at odds with scripture. But you could add to it, so that's by um, subtracting from it. That is obviously a deviant reading. That's not going to be orthodox. But you could add to it by saying, yes, he was raised from the dead. He was raised from the dead in the minds of his apostles. In the minds of his apostles, he was raised. It doesn't say in the minds of his apostles in the text. That's an inference. That actually the text doesn't warrant because they, they, he eats food and he tells Thomas that he can stick his fingers in his side. So there's a physical manifestation in front of him. He's been raised bodily. It's very clear, and that's Christian doctrine. He ascends bodily as well. There's a bodily resurrection and there's a bodily ascension. Whatever that means, whatever the nature of Jesus' body, because it, there's mystery there, he passes through walls as well. I can't pass through walls. <coughs> and Jesus didn't do it before he was raised. So what's the nature of this body? Well, it still has some physical being. So although there's mystery, there's, but it's certainly not the additional inf inference that what it means for Jesus to be raised is for his disciples to believe that in some intellectual fashion that he still lives. So that's an additional meaning, which suggests that 
the anti-type of fulfillment is not enough. So the antitype is the complete, there, you cannot add to it. You can't subtract from it and be orthodox, you can't add to it and be orthodox. <coughs> um, if you look at the, the whole history of, of reading the uh, typologically, you'll find all sorts of elaborate types and antitypes in the, in the patristic period the early church fathers. Uh, sometimes they're doing it for moral reasons um, in uh, types of Noah and the flood. Um, Noah is seen as a type of Christ. The flood is a type of baptism. This is a standard interpretation. So types as self-contained almost, like Noah is that sort of figure. And you would do the same thing, sorts of things with, with other figures like Moses and, and David. <coughs> and you could go on. Various figures are being, the, in and of themselves, types of Christ. You could even do it with Samson or Joshua. So Origen writes a homily on Joshua, uh, talks about uh, Joshua, the name Yeshua, he leads the people into the promised land. He's the new Yeshua. The first Jesus, the second Jesus. He leads them, uh, he gives them the law on the mountain, and I think there's some warrant for this, by the way, in the Sermon on the Mount. This is the mount being where, where Moses brings the Decalogue to the people of God, and Jesus says, You've heard it said, but I say to you, and, and regular references to the Torah there in his teaching. So he's, he's, he's on the mountaintop. God is, is teaching his people, and then he will lead them in a sort of an exodus into the promised land. Lots of uh, type and anti-type. So they, so they are promise and fulfillment, but they are his, there's a historical dimension to them absolutely is necessary. Uh, what it implies is progressive revelation. The Old Testament was revelation from God. It's a pneumatic text. It's God-breathed. All scripture is God-breathed. All scripture and useful for training, teaching, and righteousness, it says in the New Testament. By that, it's considering itself scripture even, but it's certainly referring to the Old Testament in this. And, it, it, and yet, it's its uh, clarity and completeness uh, and uh, fulfillment of everything is, is obviously not there until Christ comes and until the, uh, the apostles finish the canon of Scripture. But this is why you can't add to the canon of Scripture because it's an antitype. It is now fulfilled. So the, I think right at the end of the book of Revelation, it says whoever adds adds to these words, let him be accursed. You can't add to something that's already complete without denying that it was complete or suggesting it was somehow incomplete. You needed more than this. So I, I think this is the standard reading of, of scripture is type reading it typologically. Um, there, we could get into the Alexandrian and the Antiochian school. There is a tendency there uh, to read allegorically in the Alexandrian school uh, and therefore the Eastern Church and in Antioch to read it more uh, in, in the lines of Augustine, reading it first literally, by which I mean figuratively, and then, only then, allowing for the possibilities of, liter of, of figurative readings beyond that. So the moral and the, um, well, how does it go? The literal, the figure of the moral, the anagogical. So different types of uh, extended meanings that can be attached to the text. Um, and and in, in general, the, uh, I can give you the, 
the sort of motto here, if I can write it down. I'm going to give it to you in Latin, and then I'll translate for you. Written down here, so let me just do this rather than repeatedly turning around. Okay, so what does this mean? The literal teaches what the narrative means. The guest does the actions. The literal teaches what the narrative means. The uh, al allegorical, what you are to believe. The moral, what you are to do, and the anagogical, whither it tends, or is it the translation is here a little bit more, uh, a little freer than what I've just translated? The literal sense teaches you the narrative, the allegorical, what to believe, the moral, how to behave and the anagogical where you are going. So the anagogical is referring to the, what we would often call the eschatological, to the end of the journey. All four of them can often be read in, and should be read in every text, a fourfold allegorical reading. This, is, this, this uh, little formula is from Augustine of Dacia. So once again, the literal teaches you the narrative, the allegorical, what to believe, the moral, how to behave, and the anagogical, where you are going. Here's Aquinas' summary of the same thing, because fourfold, for the four, fourfold method is established um, firmly by this point. And by the way, the, the, the fourfold method here is a a uh, restriction of the possibilities of figurative readings because sometimes people went well beyond four, but they, four becomes the standard then. So this is Aquinas Summa Theologica uh, 1, 1, verse, uh, 1, 1, 10. The fir that first meaning whereby the words signify things belongs to the sense first mentioned, namely the historical or literal. That meaning, however, whereby the things signified by the words in their turn also signify other things is called the spiritual sense. And it is based on and presupposes the literal sense. So he's just following Augustine on this. Now, this spiritual sense is divided into three. The allegorical sense is brought into play when the things of the old law signifies the things of the new law. The moral sense, when the things done in Christ and in those who prefigured him are signs of what we should of what we should carry out what moralis the moral of the story you do likewise and the anagogical sense the fourth when the things that lie ahead in eternal glory are signified but not yet done or capable of being done Christ will bring about the, his own return 
it's not something that we can do anything about. <clears throat> there will be a future consummation of the church. Um, so a very quick overview of all that. Um, I think kind of useful. Well, you can tell me. But it deals with the complexity of the, of the scriptural text. And uh, the way in which, although the old and the new are both called the word of God, they seem to require a different way of reading them. And everybody comes upon that. And what first is necessary for what comes after, and yet what comes after is more is has an authority that the that the other doesn't. It's not that the other is not authoritative. It's that it's it needs to be seen typologically. There's a promise there, and there's a fulfillment. Well, you don't understand uh, the fulfillment unless you read the promise to begin with. So it's necessary and it's authoritative. All of it is authoritative, but it's how do you read those two testaments? And again, this is no, there is no text like this that requires this sort of complex reading practice and the typological and the promise and the fulfillment or the adumbration or however you want to present them, figurative. So that alone, when I came to read, read uh, the Bible uh, more seriously as a, as a grad student and saw the complexity of the text, uh, there's no text that's like this. There simply isn't. And so the modern in, in the academy, um, which I was raised in to read, the ways in which I read, say, Shakespeare, um, they do apply here, but there's, there are other things about it that simply don't apply. I, I can read, but I'm not reading this text rightly. There's, a, there's another text that I need to have read. I need to have read the Old Testament to understand the New Testament properly, but also I need to have read the New Testament in, a, in order to really rightly read the Old Testament even. Very complicated. And the complexity is increased by m the modern or general hermeneutics of Schleiermacher, which treats them all as effectively the same sort of text. As historical, it uses a historical method, historical critical method that is derived in the 18th century, and then removes the fact that it's a, a pneumatic text, which places the critic above scripture then, and is critical of it. So, and where, where we come across miracles, we, dis, we debunk them saying that can't be verified, can't be tested. A lot is based on the authority of the authors that the postulate of the enlightenment simply won't accept. I want to be able to see for myself and verify for myself. Well, Scripture is not going to allow you to do that. You have to trust the, an authority above your own authority in order to understand this text. The New Testament appeals to the authority of the Old Testament and yet says that its reading of it is authoritative. So, <laughs> the modern reader who comes to the text is used to, I am going to to read the text and decide what it means. That's not going to work here. It's very easy to misread what Luther is going to say as a species of that, of the modern romantic hermeneutics of Schleiermacher. I don't think that that is what Luther is saying at all. But let, let's come to Luther now. Oh, look, there's a great little uh, 
This is from Nicholas of Lyra. Circa 1270 to 1340. And I'm going to quote. One should also understand that the literal sense of the text has been much obscured because of the manner of expounding the text commonly handed down by others. Although they have said much that is good, yet they have been inadequate in their treatment of the literal sense and have so multiplied the number of mystical senses that the literal sense is in some part cut off and suffocated among so many mystical senses. Moreover, they have chopped the text into so many small parts and brought, brought forth so many concordant passages to suit their own purpose that, to some degree, they confuse both the mind and memory of the reader and distract it from understanding the literal meaning of the text. And remember, Augustine, Aquinas, actually the entire church, will say that the first reading of Scripture is always the literal. Always. And so Nicholas of Lyra, this is in the 13th century, is already concerned about habits of reading that are obscuring the literal meaning. And if you're going to obscure the literal meaning, then the mystical or spiritual readings that follow are going to be based on nothing, just speculation. It's going to take you away from Scripture. So there's a problem with reading Scripture. Now, in the medieval schools, the way in which Bibles were printed, remember the printing press does not exist in the Middle Ages. To reproduce a Bible is costly, um, labor-intensive, and time-consuming. It would be manuscripts. You would have to write it out. Even to produce it would cost the labor of the monks to do it and the time, and it would very few people would have a copy of, of Scripture. Uh, but the text that was read in the medieval schools, by which I mean the medieval university, was a glossed text. It was called the Glossa Ordinaria. And what that means is that there was a, uh, a, a verse, which we would call the biblical verse, surrounded by notes and commentaries from the fathers in the margins. You know, modern texts have your annotated Bible by some, some individual who's giving you their commentary on what the verses mean. There it would be that what the, what the tradition says that these texts mean. Well, Jerome says this, and Augustine says this, and Aquinas says this, etc. That would be in the margins, so in the gloss. And that was what was used in universities. So there's the authority of Scripture, and then there's the authority of the, of the fathers. The fathers have authority. Why? Because they have the Holy Spirit. It's not that they have no authority. There's a, here's a way in which God has used later writers to bring out some of the meaning in even the fulfilled meaning of Scripture. So there's no reference to the Trinity in the, um, as in the word Trinity in the Bible. And yet the rule of faith will require that we adhere and affirm the work of the Trinity in Scripture. And the, the patristic period fleshes that out. So it's not to, the fact that the authorities are being referred to is not a problem. It's, it's faithful to do this. But in effect, the, uh, and this is Bruns's comment, the biblical text is materially embedded in a history of interpretation. So now we just don't have the, the text that was the divine pneumatic text. We also have the authorities that have arisen in response to that text. So it's embedded in the glossa or the tongues of authoritative writers, some of them saints. Now, here's the, and this is Bruns, I think it's quite clever. He says, if one were, were to look for a symbolic moment of transition between ancient and modern hermeneutics, one might choose the winter semester of 1513 to 1514 when Martin Luther began preparing his first lectures as professor of theology at the University of Wittenberg. 
he was to lecture on the Psalms and wanted each of his students to have a copy of the scriptural text to consult. This is novel. Why is it novel? Because the printing press exists. It didn't exist before. Like if I asked this as a professor before, it just like, uh, you're going to have to wait a long time. All, everyone has their own biblical text. That's going to take an inordinate amount of time. And it will, co it will cost a lot of money to do that as well. So no professor would have been able to do it. Um, but Johann Grunenberg, uh, the university printer, was able to fulfill this request. So he produces the text, but he, he instructs him to produce an edition of the Psalter with very wide margins and lots of white space between the lines. So there's the, a verse, and then there's white space all around, just like here, around the word glossa ordinaria. And in that, <clears throat> the, the students would presumably reproduce Luther's own comments uh, and perhaps their own reflections. Like some people in their Bibles write little notes, comments, and th those would go in the blank space. <laughs> and so <clears throat> what Brun says, at all events, Luther produced for his students something like a modern as opposed to medieval text of the Bible its modernity consisting precisely in the white space around the text. In a stroke, Luther wiped the sacred page clean as if to begin the history of interpretation over again, this time to get it right. Now that's Brun's take on this. It's very, I think, clever. So he's using it as a symbol. And he wipes out church history in the process. He wipes out the authority of, of the tradition and the rule of faith, says Bruns. I think that this is not accurate myself. Not wholly accurate. It is accurate in the sense that the text was produced this way and the Glossa Ordinaria has been dispensed with and he's going to start, well, let's just look at what scripture says. But in doing that, he would have cited, and the reformers certainly cited, what the patristic period said about scripture, and at times agreed with it, and at times disagreed with it, on the basis of the authority of the scripture, however. Why? Because they took the, the biblical text to have an authority that even those who have the Holy Spirit do not, because they contradict themselves at points. At points. But the case in point was it over the doctrine of purgatory and also the authority of the Pope to interpret scripture or even the church to interpret scriptures. And Luther's claim, as he's pushed on this, is that scripture is its own interpreter. It, 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 it is a pneumatic text in which God is present and authoritatively interprets his scripture, his, the meaning of the text to the heart of the reader. That's not the same thing as what Schleiermacher is talking about in treating it as a non-pneumatic text. It's still a pneumatic text. In fact, that's exactly the point. I want you to ignore the noise around the text, which is, I mean, that's pejorative on my part, but let's just focus on this first of all. Remember, he's dealing with seminary students who've never read, read the scripture for themselves. They've never had the... Uh, capacity, not the ability to read it because they didn't have a Bible to read. And now they do. So let's read this first. Let's start with foundational stuff and then we can move to the other things. That's not the same thing as what modern hermeneutics with Schleiermacher is doing at all, in my opinion. And I've given you the reasons for my opinion. Um, I'm, I'm going to read again from 
Bruins here and his commentary, but I already told you I disagree with him and why I disagree. I think he's misrepresenting Luther as the beginning of uh, the tendency to place, <laughs> which is there of the modern scientific era and there of the historical critical method of placing the reader above scripture and above the tradition. Luther's point is to do the exact opposite. And it's not to dis disparage the tradition, but he's to say that even the tradition needs to be normed by scripture. So this scripture then is an unnormed norm. It's normative. Scripture is normative, yes. In what sense? It's an unnormed norm. There is no other, there's nothing that uh, it needs to appeal to to be normative. It already has authority. It carries its own authority. It interprets itself. Whereas the tradition is also normative. After all, Augustine refers to it as the rule of faith. It's a rule. It, ha it has an authority. But it's not an unnormed norm. It's a normed norm. Tradition itself can be corrected by an appeal to scripture, not by an appeal to the church, but by an appeal to scripture. Scripture is normative in all of the decisions over the matters of, of life and faith. Why? Because it's typological. There's the antitype. It's finished. Not only the work of Christ is finished, but the work of authority is finished. Here's the authoritative reading. You may not add to this or take away from it. You may not do so. And the church has no authority to exceed its authority because it is normed by scripture. Scripture has a, is a normed norm. And tradition is normative, but in a lesser sense. It, it, it also is subject to the normative authority of scripture, which means that it's subject to the normative authority of God himself. So that the church is, needs to recognize its own limitations here. Does that make sense? It's not that he's getting rid of figurative readings in, or typological readings. If you read the Reformation, it is full of typological readings. They're constantly referring to different types and anti-types. Promises, fulfillments, shadows, figurations. All of that language is used over and over and over. It's not just an emphasis on the literal. That's the, that's the scientific age where they're going to say, we're going to get rid of the spiritual sense of the scripture. We're only going to talk about the, the uh, historical and verifiable with my eyes. That's, that's, that's the enlightenment. It's going to insist on that. That's not Luther's point at all. Modernity does not begin with Luther. So here's, here's Augustine, who's drawing on, or rather here's Aquinas, drawing on Augustine's theory of signs. And um, what Augustine says here is authoritative for many Christian theologians uh, to this day. Quote, the multiplicity of the senses does not produce equivocation or any other kind of multiplicity between the literal and the, or, or the literal and the figurative or the moral and the allegorical and the anagogical. It doesn't uh, result in any other kind of multiplicity, seeing that these senses are not multiplied because one word signifies several things, but because the things signified by the words can be themselves signs of other things. That's why. Thus in the Holy Scripture for all the senses are founded on one, the literal, says Augustine, from which alone can any argument be drawn. So you always have to go back to the literal to make an argument. You can't go to an extended 
and then make an argument on that basis, you have to go back to the literal. And not from those intended allegorically, as Augustine says. Nevertheless, nothing of Holy Scripture perishes because of this, since nothing ne necessary to faith is contained under the spiritual sense, which is not elsewhere put forward clearly by the Scripture in its literal sense. So even Augustine is, or, or Aquinas is acknowledging that the literal undergirds all the others. Now, sometimes it's not the same point as Luther's making in suggesting the normativity, the unnormed normativity of scripture. It's not quite the same. But there is a hierarchy there in, in reading. You first go the literal, and here you first go to what scripture says, or what, what the literal meaning of scripture says. So if there is multiple meanings, the multiple meanings is of the things, not the words. So if senses are multiple, they're not secret or hidden, uh, or if they are hidden, they're hidden only by the process of time. So in, in um, um, prophecy to the uh, hearers of the day, they probably sound very obscure, and then later they say, oh, this is a reference to this event, which happened in history. So they're not hidden uh, by anything other than the fact that they the prophecy is not yet just has not yet become a literal event, but it will be one day, and then it will be clear what the prophecy was hinting at. And so, what Luther says here is the same thing as Augustine, because Augustine says, "Remember, Luther is an Augustinian monk." He says this: "Hardly anything may be found in these obscure places which is not found plainly elsewhere. So let the Scriptures interpret the Scriptures." Let the New Testament, for example, shed its light on the old. Let words always be construed in light of the thing itself, namely the light or rule of faith. Quote, whatever happens in the divine word that does not literally pertain to virtuous behavior or to the truth of the faith, you must take to be figurative. For scripture teaches nothing but charity, nor condemns anything but cupidity, and in this way shapes the minds of men. Note here that when Augustine is appealing to the literal meaning, uh, he doesn't mean, he means he, he, even there he means it in a spiritual sense because he says that it, it refers to love or charity. And a misreading refers to cupidity, a, a misdirection of love. So even the literal sense for Augustine uh, needs to be seen as a spiritual sense. And that's hence the sense that uh, all reading, all proper reading of Scripture is spiritual reading, even when you read it literally. It's not reducible to the grammar of the text. So the historical critical method, which uses grammatical methods, is already, even at the first blush, wrong, because it, it's not reading it spiritually. It's not reducible to the grammar of the text. It's rather the spirit or fore understanding in which the text is to be studied. And quote Augustine again, he is a slave to a sign who uses or worships a significant thing without knowing what it signifies. So in other words, you have to have faith in order to read the text properly. If you don't know that the, that, that the biblical text is pointing to Christ always, then you're never going to read it even grammatically correctly. But he who uses or venerates a useful sign, divinely instituted, whose signifying force he understands, does not venerate what he sees and what passes away, but rather that to which such things are to be referred. So in other words, you have to understand the things logically Logically, the understanding of things logically precedes the understanding of the words. So you already have to know the meaning before you read it. You have to have Christ. Christ has to come to you. This is one of the reasons I'm a Calvinist. And God comes to us and he, his spirit is 
directs us to Christ. He is there. In the reading of his text, the Holy Spirit is present and directs us to the person of Christ. So the written words lead us to the, li to the living word by the Spirit given to those whom God blesses with faith. So faith has a task which makes both the things and the words transparent. So we see what they mean because we know that they refer to Christ and his kingdom. And now here's, this is uh, Bruns' comment and this, it's sort of interesting. To put it another way, the distinction between letter and spirit refers to two different ways of inhabiting a specific or in, in brackets, in this case, historically Christian, hermeneutical situation, and not simply to two ways of interpreting a text. Yes, it's two, two, two different ways of, of being, almost, and not just two different ways of reading. In what spirit do you read the scriptures? Do you read it as the word of God? Do you recognize this authority? Do you realize that you have to pray to understand it? Because it's not, you don't have, the, it's not that you're able to read. Yes, but you can't read this text. You have to acknowledge that it's a holy word from God. So it's how you approach the text. Hardly anything may be found in these obscure places, says Augustine, which is not found plainly and said elsewhere. But before this can happen, we need to be turned toward the text in the proper way. And that is the main concern of De Doctrina Christiana on Christian doctrine, as we said. You have, to have, you have to be directed towards the ultimate thing, towards God, before you can even read the scriptures rightly. And your heart needs to be purified. You, there's, so the, the reader is the problem here. Not the text, the reader is the problem. You're not going to read the Bible rightly if you are not yet saved. Now you will be saved. Part of God's salvific effort is to use the word preached to bring people to faith, hence the importance of preaching. But you're not just going to be able to pick up a Bible with vast intellectual and reading ability and read it rightly on your own. Not so. Unless God is present, you will not read it rightly. You will misread it. And it's a different text than any other text. You will not require Christian faith to read Shakespeare. I think you will read him with greater profundity, but it's not that you can't understand what he's saying. And there's a level on which you're not going to read him, I think. But it's not the same thing as you totally misread him, whereas this will be a total misreading. If you do not affirm Jesus as Lord and Savior, then you are not reading the text. I remember at the end of book two, Augustine talks about the steps that you have to take in order to be in a position to understand what you're reading. <coughs> and, you, and, and each of these steps identifies a part of a state of mind or spirit in which we uh, move towards the text. We have to begin with fear. We begin with fear. Then we need piety. Then we need knowledge. We need fortitude and mercy. And finally, in the sixth step, the eye is cleansed to see in the way that those who die to the world do. But there's a a, a, a six-step process there. And it's at that point that you're transformed and you can read rightly and not before it. So any old person can take a Bible, stand up in front of a church and read it. But they're not reading it spiritually until they have the Spirit of God. So again, 
with respect to reading scripture, and this is a literary theory class, it doesn't apply to non-biblical texts, but it does apply to biblical texts. And again, lit theory, the Bible is a work of literature. It does apply there. I need to talk about this here. You can have all the ability to read that text in the world, but unless you have faith, you are not reading the text properly. You will not. That, that's the simple point that's being made. And part of that is recognizing the, uh, that this text has a normativity and authority that no other text does and no other um, interpreter does. And that's the point of Luther's white margin around. It's not to denigrate the church fathers. It's just to say their authority, which they have, and he's not going to deny, is not of the same authority as the text itself. It's a lesser magistrate. It's a normed norm. And the normed norm needs to always be normed by Scripture, not just by what the church councils say, because the church councils often disagree with one another. And the case in point in his day is the doctrine of purgatory, which he says has no scriptural warrant. This is a problem I know in, in, uh, in the Catholic tradition, the Eastern Orthodox, both of them will affirm purgatory in different senses, by the way. They disagree on the nature of purgatory. They, they can't come together because um, for Catholics, it's a place. There's a place of burning, fire. Not so in the Eastern tradition, but there's still a purgatory. We don't use that term. You don't even use the term. Right. After, after, right, that's why I say it's not a place. Yeah, so it's you don't use the term. And it's not temporal as well. Right. Yeah. Right. So that that actually for from a a Protestant perspective, from a Lutheran perspective, is that might be possible. But the the idea of a place saying, hmm, I don't think so. And that's what he would have been confronting in in, uh, in Germany. Right? He's, he's not dealing with the Eastern Orthodox, he's dealing with the uh, Roman Catholics these days and the abuse of authority of Johannes Tetzel, who is going around uh, selling indulgences to fund the war against uh, the Turk and to build St. Peter's. Um, and, and really ab just terrifying people to give money, people who are terribly poor and clear abuse. And he, he was eventually. Uh, uh, arrested by the authorities because they recognize the abuse there. But they let him do it at first because he's doing a lot of good things here. Um, anyway, so the appropriation of a text is also applied to readers. The readers also need to be uh, uh, appropriated. So you interpret yourself in the process. You bring, the, the reader is an essential part of the process. Now this, when you come to 20th century literary theory, they're going to call this the, um, the what, do, what is this fallacy? It's the effective fallacy. If you appeal to the reader and the reader's understanding of the text, you're, you're appealing to the effect of the text on the reader. This is the, what they call the effective fallacy. How I feel about the text. And of course, if you were using the historical critical method in relation to scripture, that would, re in, in biblical studies, they call this reader response theory. in which you effectively say, it doesn't matter what the biblical text says, what do I think the text ought to say? Or how does it speak to me from the perspective of whatever identity group I belong to? But that's moving far away from these initial, that Luther is not appealing to reader response theory. He's not making a, an effective fallacy, although he's been, he is charged with this sometimes by commentators who I think are mis, misunderstanding the point that he's making. 
about the authority of scripture. He's not saying it's my, my feelings or the, the reader's feelings that are the most important. It's about the authority of scripture. And it, is the Holy Spirit not present when scripture is interpreted? Yes. Anyway, there's, there, are, there are complexities and problems that arise out of this, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll read one final section here from uh, Bruns, which I think is helpful. Understanding, in effect, presupposes conversion. Presupposes conversion. As Augustine says in his Confessions, his first experience of the scriptures was to be repelled by them. That's when he rejected them. Approached in a Ciceronian spirit, or those of a classical scholar, they are an absurd and garbled text, a book without reason or eloquence. Augustine had to learn to read them with the eyes of St. Ambrose. His conversion enabled him to enter into the spirit or the intelligibility of the scriptures, which explains why the Confessions conclude with Augustine's commentary on Genesis, in which he offers a practical demonstration of what it means to be at last in a position to understand and expound the sacred text. And it's, the, it's Augustine's theory of spirit and letter that Luther follows in his controversies with Rome. So he appeals to the authority of Augustine. Many Catholics say that he's misrepresenting Augustine in this. I'm not sure. There's a debate to be had there. But uh, his claim is that there, there's a clarity and a self-sufficiency uh, in the scriptural text against that the, the idea that the scriptures being obscure can be understood not in themselves but only through the church's authoritative interpretations. That's what he's arguing against. These are, the scriptures are so, so obscure that ordinary people cannot be trusted to read them. He says, no, they are sufficiently clear if you have faith. They're sufficiently clear. And that doesn't remove, say there's no problems or difficult passages in scripture, but there are areas, and Augustine himself talks about them, that are so clear and plain that everyone understands them. And those are the ones you go in the areas where there are complexities and problems. So, here's Luther's motto. Aaron is the uh, Moses' brother. He speaks on his behalf to Pharaoh at points. And he's also a Levite. He's the first in the Levitical priesthood, right? But you could take Aaron as the representative of the priesthood in general. And not just as a Levite, but of the priesthood and of the authority of, of the priesthood in uh, bringing God's word to people as, as pastors and shepherds and stuff. But Luther's motto is let Aaron be just Aaron in the simple sense, unless the spirit interprets him in a new literal sense. Note that it, there can be a second literal sense in a new literal sense, as when St. Paul makes Christ out of Aaron for the Hebrews. Hebrews 9 verse 10. Look at Hebrews 9 verse 10. Where... where Aaron is reinterpreted literally to mean something other than what he meant in the Old Testament. So it's going to be re, -re it's going to be rereading scriptural practices in various ways. As I say, it starts with the indulgences and the doctrine of purgatory, and it starts to expand out over the authority of scripture. Who is a who has, who is authorized to read scripture authoritatively? It's obvious that it, it's useful to have training in reading scripture. But it is not for the, a few individuals to decide what scripture means, especially when they, they move away from the normative authority of scripture. That's Luther's whole point. Which doesn't mean to say that everything the church has said is wrong. On the contrary, he's going to affirm the ecumenical creeds. There's no dispute over that in the Reformation. Not one. Not one will depart from the ecumenical creeds. But some of the later councils, it's teaching on celibacy, 
it's teaching on purgatory. These are doctrines from the 12th century. And so forth. they say these are late and they're disputed even within Christendom. Everywhere, as, as you said, the East, the East will deny that there is a literal place of purgatory at all. And, the, and Rome's uh, rejoinder is simply, uh, Pope's here. <laughs> we have the authority to determine this and think, okay, no, you do not. You do not have that authority. The determinant of the authoritative, uh, who's going to resolve the dispute? Scripture is going to resolve the dispute for you. And it'll have all sorts of other implications, though. But he'll dispute the, the requirement of celibacy for the priesthood, even while saying that Paul authorized it and says it's better to be unmarried for certain things. But he doesn't say you must be celibate in order to be a priest. In the Eastern tradition, again, they allow priests to marry. And it's a late development in, in Roman Catholicism that required it, compelled it, as uh, for those who felt a vocation to the priesthood, that they also renounce marital life, etc. Again, that's just a few different areas. Anyway, but that's the main point, is how we read scripture. And I, I think it's, it's useful just to pause there and see uh, that, because this is going to be a significant period, even within, uh, for reading English literature, for how things are read in the 16th and 17th century. When, come the 18th century, uh, the Enlightenment kicks in, and literal starts to be presented in a different sense than the spiritual sense in everything. Um, but that's, that's for later. That's it for today.